Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. In an era in which everything is politicized, from the TV shows and the movies we watch to the places we shop, it's not surprising that architecture and design would also be reflective of the politics of the day. But that fact is nothing new. For proof of this, we need to look no further than Philip Johnson. Considered one of the greatest modern architects, he would spend a good part of his life caught in the vortex between his politics and his art. His art on the one hand reflecting who he really was, because art seldom lies, but also using the scope and causes of that work to try and escape from who he was and what he believed. This particular dilemma lies at the heart of an insightful new biography of Johnson by my guest, Mark Lamster. Mark Lamster is the architectural critic of the Dallas Morning News. He's a professor in the architecture school at the University of Texas Arlington and a 2017 Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. It is my pleasure to welcome Mark Lamster here to talk about his new book, The Man in the Glass House, Philip Johnson, Architect of the Modern Century. Mark Lamster, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, great to have you here. One of the things that we know about Johnson, and one of the things I think people know best about him, is the way in which his work represents the enthusiasm and the challenges of of the post-war years. But talk a little bit about the period of time before World War II, the evolution of Johnson, his political views, and some of his early work. Well, one of the interesting things about Johnson is that architecture was not actually his first career. It was kind of his third career. Uh, He had this kind of sad childhood, and he had uh, sort of some uh, mental issues, some mental health issues. He had bipolar disorder. So it took him seven years to get through college. He went to Harvard. Uh, And when he graduated, he finally figured out kind of what he wanted to do, and it was to sort of study architecture and be a curator Uh, And he joins the fledgling Museum of Modern Art, which has just been found at that point. And he becomes the first uh, architecture curator curator at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, And in that capacity, he has uh, these amazingly uh, important shows, uh, the first on uh, European modernism and the next one on uh, industrial design. And these make him... uh, sort of a boy wonder curator. Um, But he decides in 1934, after his second ginormously successful show, to just throw it all away. And he has become entranced by uh, populist fascist politics. Um, And he quits the museum, uh, causing front page headlines, uh, to found a we today called an alt-right, that then was a nationalist, populist uh, political party. And for really the next six and seven or seven years, he proceeds uh, to, as a political uh, figure to try and develop a political career. Um, he tries, he glommed on to Huey Long, a, a senator and governor uh, from Louisiana, the Kingfish. Uh, sort of a dictatorial figure in American politics. Uh, And he then follows that by uh, latching on to um, uh, Father Coughlin, sort of a Rush Limbaugh, Alex Jones figure uh, who has his own political ambitions. Uh, And sort of when these kind of fail, he turns to... Uh, Germany and uh, Italy, uh, which has been following along uh, throughout to try and uh, figure out how to mainstream uh, uh, sort of a a fascism uh, in America. Uh, And he becomes an active proponent of uh, Nazi state uh, collaborator, uh, effectively an agent of the Nazi state, distributing their propaganda and providing information to them uh, on uh, individuals who uh, might support their cause here. Um, really trying to, uh, you know, the Nazi state very interested in keeping America out of European affairs, obviously. Uh, and one of the ways they thought they could do this was by uh, through developing an intellectual class of Americans 
um, who could st- sort of mainstream fascism, uh, perhaps take a little of the barbarism out of it, but tell Americans that, yes, um, Germany might not be your cup of tea, but it's not worth, you know, starting a war over it. And uh, there are actually some very good ideas there. And so Johnson becomes enwrapped in this and uh, an active proponent of it. And only after World War II starts and he realizes the disastrous folly of his ways, uh, does he sort of need to reinvent himself so he attends uh, architecture school so he can sort of get out of the spotlight and try and um, uh, remake his life uh, after this uh, embarrassing period, what will become an embarrassing period for him. Uh, and that's when he becomes an architect. And so, uh, And then after he graduates, he starts building uh, these sort of his first uh, works of architecture, which are beautiful Miesian, uh residential works. So that in the post-war years, um, America is an uh, optimistic place, and there's a, a new business class of moving to out of the city and into the suburbs, a kind of upper class. And, and Johnson's architecture caters directly to this. And he's well positioned to do so with his society friends, um, and this is the, the sort of his first architectural career. It's sort of a, a high-end residential architect, not the the um, skyscraper architect that people probably know best. Was there early on, going back to, to the period of time that he was at the museum and, and curating these amazing shows like the, his machine art show in 1934, was there any indication or anything that gave a hint of the nexus between the the work he was doing in terms of art and design and the way it led to his, his fascist and populist politics? Well, for Johnson, Johnson was a formalist, um, and he had a very aestheticized uh, view of uh, architecture and design. He believed in sort of order and beauty and sort of these classical principles, I think you can translate those into sort of some of the fascist ideology, but um, in some way they were separate. And one of the interesting things is um, the disconnect between these two. Uh, Really, um, the sort of populist strain of fascism, uh, uh, Hitler's fascism uh, in the wake of you know, this great depression that happens uh, and modernism's response to that is, you know, modernism is as much a social and progressive movement as an architectural movement. Uh, and a lot of its values are uh, uh, intertwined, right? This aesthetic and progressive values are intertwined in those modern, early modern years. But when Johnson imports modernism to America, he's looking at at it purely as an aesthetic. Um, uh, he's not interested in any of that social uh, social justice aspect of it. And so the first, in, his first grand show is 1932 is the international, what we call today the international style show. This is where he sort of imports the Corbusier and Gropius and Mies and shows them and sort of introduces that kind of European modernism to America, but he's completely stripped its bare of its progressivism. It's, it's here for its aesthetic value, its artistic value. And again, this is like the height of the Depression. So there's a big, you know, that there should be a large attention paid to sort of housing and um, other social works. And there is a part of the show that attacks that, but Johnson just offloads it entirely to Lewis Mumford, another uh, historian, because he just has zero interest in it. Um, and then in 1934, when he sort of breaks with the museum, uh, it's almost kind of ridiculous because we have this Johnson here who talks about how what America needs now is a populist. We don't need intellectuals. We, and he's he's basically telling the press about how what America doesn't need is intellectuals. And here he is, this sort of Harvard graduate who works at a Rockefeller museum, who's just, you know, sort of justified having, 
you know, ball bearings on display in a museum using Plato, and now he's telling the world that we don't need intellectual, that it's sort of um, uh, complete hypocrisy. And I thought that's the story of Johnson. There's always this deep hypocrisy uh, or deep contradictions in his positions. He was, his great genius was to occupy two opposing positions at the same time. To what extent was it the genius of, of sort of holding these two ideas together at the same time? And or to what extent was it trying to escape at various points kind of politics and, and, and places that he had gotten himself into that he wanted to get away from or, or felt he needed to get away from for his career? Well, I don't know that he ever really wanted to get away from politics. I, I think, um, you know, Johnson had to get away from his past a little bit uh, after the war um, and his anti-Semitism. Uh, but he always had had Jewish friends. Like right? He was able to be anti-Semitic and have Jewish friends. That was part of his um, his ability. And, you know, he, in order to sort of cleanse his past, he designs a synagogue and designs it for free. Now, was that an act of cynicism because it was kind of a loss leader for his fledgling practice, the biggest building he'd ever designed at that point? Or was it an act of true contrition? It was kind of both. There, there's uh, also there's you, also this relationship he has with this German ar- German architect Otto Eisler, that that who, Jewish German architect that he's friends with, but really doesn't do much to help. No, he doesn't. Um, he doesn't do much to help at all, and he was in a position to help uh, Eisler. So this Eisler, one of the more significant Czech modernists of that period, Johnson had befriended him uh, in his time as a curator, and then Eisler is captured by the Gestapo and tortured, and Johnson comes upon him and uh, sort of probably is in a position to help him through his own connections and sort of doesn't really bother to do it. Uh, It's a very sad chapter in his life. Um, But, you know, can we forgive Johnson for his trespasses? You know, he did... Yeah, this is a man who, 15 years after uh, supporting Hitler, uh, built a nuclear reactor in Israel, but commissioned essentially by Shimon Peres, uh, then helped the Jewish state develop the bomb. Um, so uh, if Shimon Peres could forgive Johnson, uh, it begs the question, or ask, you know, what, what, who can you? I, I, I think everybody needs to ask that question for themselves and and come to their own answer. Right. You you have a line in the book that, that that sort of tries to sum up who he was. When you say he he was a gay man with a fascist history, living in a glass house, who liked nothing better than to throw stones. Talk about that. That's you know that was the essence of Johnson. Was he? Loved to stir up trouble. You know, he. I wrote this book because I didn't just want to write about Johnson as a person, but I wanted to write about the entire American century, and he lived all of it. And he was causing problems for all of it. He was he was a stirring up trouble for all of it. He was this figure of the establishment of blue blood uh, power broker. But he was also constantly uh, causing, you know, an enfant, wanting to be an enfant terrible, wanting to be the center of attention, wanting to um, cause controversy. He loved to be at the center of, of controversy. Um, and, and that's, that's a, an essential duality uh, that, was a, that was a part of him. Um, so I think that makes him fascinating. And talk about the way it played out in his later work, that the same person that could be involved in the Seagram building also designed the AT&T building in New York. Well, I mean, that was it, right? I, I think architecture is, you know, conceived of as a very moralistic profession. So in changing aesthetics is not only considered a 
you can uh, something uh, a critical uh, in, in his his willingness to to switch um, aesthetical aesthetic directions was criticized not just uh, for a, as a weakness intellectually but as sort of a moral flaw. Um, so this is Johnson, who is a devoted Miesian. He really introduces Mies to America, right. uh, curates the first major exhibition of Mies's work in 1947 at MoMA. Um, uh, works with Mies closely as his partner on the Seagram building, perhaps the greatest of all modernist skyscrapers. Um, and his early work is infused with Miesian ideas. But really from the outset, even as he's working on the Seagram with Mies, he's, he's also subverting Miesian ideas in some of his other buildings. His glass house is a play on Mises Farnsworth's house, but it subvert some of Mises' fundamental ideas. Uh, it's, you know, in the ground, whereas Mises' Farnsworth house, on which it was based, it sort of floats. Um, it's, it's very... And then, you know, Johnson is constantly looking to to overthrow him. There's a very much an edi- edible relationship there. And, uh, you know, what could be more edible than, you know, this AT&T tower, right? It's the ultimate rejection of the Nisian way is uh, to sort of throw up this building that uh, looks like a giant grandfather clock, right? And was it a joke? Was he serious? It wasn't clear. Um, it was sort of the most controversial building of its era. Uh, it was put him, put Johnson on the cover of Time magazine five years before it even opened. Um, and, and he loved that. He loved that controversy. He loved to be that center of attention. How did a building like Pennzoil Plaza in Houston, how did that fit into the to his equation? Well, Johnson, what's interesting about Johnson is that Johnson, the skyscraper architect, is really a late, uh, a late development in his career. He spent the early part of his architecture career, and remember, architecture is really only his third profession. He spent the early part of his career as a residential architect. Um, and has grand ambitions, but they're not being met. His commissions that grow after that are almost all institutional. He's unable to uh, get the commercial clients that he'd really like because he's this sort of dangerous person. He is this gay man who lives in a glass house who throws stones with a fascist history, right? So the corporate clients aren't coming, and they don't come until the late 60s. Um, when he realizes that he needs a partner who can facilitate uh, those relationships. And he joins up with a man named John Berge, who came from C.F. Murphy, Murphy Associates, a big Chicago corporate firm. And Berge is tall and handsome, uh, a man in a blue suit, uh, an executive, an executive comfortable talking to other executives. And it's through Berge that that, that this sort of new that Johnson, the skyscraper architect, can finally happen. And their first two skyscrapers, the first is the IDS Tower in Minneapolis, the next is Pennzoil Place in, in Houston, and they're modern, but they are sort of a next generation Messianism. Uh, they are uh, elegant uh, glass towers, but they have uh, interesting geometries and these beautiful open courts uh, at their bases. Um, and this is sort of Johnson uh, moving beyond Mies in a modern way. But at the same time, uh, it's just not enough. And I think he's looking at the work of Robert Venturi uh, and others, and uh, these buildings are celebrated uh, but he is looking to be more controversial for a new way, for some other way to break out of modernism. Uh, and that's when he starts uh, looking. We have the um, AT&T Tower and other buildings with more overt references to the past um, and, and that moves clearly into postmodernism and beyond uh, modern 
talk about the beyond, where he saw that going, because the postmodernism, you know, and, and there were much that was talked about at the time with respect to AT&T, a kind of new classicism that, that, that he was evolving. Well, yeah, Johnson had all these periods, right? I mean, uh, the residential period was nice. Then he did a lot of institutional building, uh, buildings like Lincoln Center in New York that were, we would call today the new formalism, the kind of fascistic, uh, modern, classical, very serious and austere with, you know, marble and uh, terrazzo, very white, uh, formal fronts. Um, and he was wrestling with what an architecture should be. He was, it was really had trouble figuring out where architecture was going. He had a period where he was inspired by the work of Lou Kahn, and you get a sort of a more monumental, blocky uh, structures, like his addition to the Boston Public Library. Um, and then there's a period where he just really doesn't know what a building should look like, and all of a sudden he starts uh, throwing buildings underground and just throwing a grass you know, blanket over them. Uh, just like, so they had no facade at all. It's just a, a door with a, a glass roof. Uh, and there are a series of these buildings around America just because he wasn't sure what a building should look like. And ironically, was like 20 years later, uh, this became quite fashionable because the, it was sort of green uh, to have a, a green roof uh, and a green building. But Johnson wasn't really interested in green. And for him, it was just a sort of a camouflage to disguise the fact that he wasn't sure where architecture was going. Mm-hmm. But finally, I, I think he, so he's constantly shifting and moving around. And of course, this constant shifting uh, is perceived as by many of his peers as a sort of moral weakness. But I think also, and, and in many ways it was, it showed a sort of a lack of principle, the lack of a core idea about what an architecture should be. He was always hunting for something new. But I also think that's part of who he was, right? He, he was a man who had, he had bipolar disorder. So from his very earliest days, there were always a sort of multiple Johnson. There was this up manic Johnson, and then there was down low depressed Johnson. There was the gay Johnson who lived privately, and then the public Johnson who had to be disguised himself. So there were always multiple Johnsons uh, at, at any one moment. So for him, living with duality was a sort of a natural state. One of the things that seems to have been consistent is his dislike of Frank Lloyd Wright and his work. I wouldn't say dislike. I, I think uh, there was tremendous admiration uh, coupled to, um, I think, a a broad sense of uh, irritation and um, jealousy. Uh, he, he really did admire Wright and Wright's incredible protean ability to just create, right? Johnson often talked about his problems facing the blank sheet of paper, like where do you begin, right? That was, that's sort of the, the, the beginning of his problem with all of this style switching. He wasn't sure where to go or what to do, whereas Wright never had a problem. And some of the most, I think one of the most beautiful things that Johnson ever wrote, Johnson was a wonderful, wonderful writer and critic. And one of the most beautiful things he wrote was an essay called The Frontiersman uh, about Wright and about visiting Wright in his um, desert headquarters, Talius and West. And about the experience of walking through that, of proceeding through this space and finally meeting uh, Wright. Uh, and it's this really touching, moving exploration of Wright's architecture. But there is something about it that is also dismissive, um, right? I mean, he calls Wright the frontiersman, which is the kind of thing that made Wright absolutely furious, right? Wright considered himself uh, a modernist beyond all others and, and the most contemporary of, of um, architects. And here's Johnson always kind of trying to shove him out into the past as this sort of uh, American figure of greatness from, from the past, uh, the fr- some person on the, on, the, on the frontier from way back when. Um, Johnson, when they host that first exhibition, the 1932 
uh, international style show, Modern Architecture International Exhibition with its formal title, they include light because they figure there is no way to have an exhibition on modern architecture in America without light. He's necessary, um, even though he just completely doesn't fit into the rest of to the paradigm of the show. And Wright knows this and doesn't really want to be a part of it because of that, but also wants to be a part of it because it's going to be a big show and he's got his own narcissistic issues. And so they have this sort of constant, you know, they, they need each other in that way, um, but they're also bitter about each other for that same reason. And it's a sort of difficult relationship they have. And in the catalog to that show, you know, John, uh, Wright is described with great admiration, but he's also listed along with, you know, Thoreau and Emerson and, uh, and those figures, like none of them had been alive for decades. And, and here's Wright, who's, you know, it's 1932, he's, you know, the Guggenheim is still like three decades in the future. So um, Wright was very, you know, could be very bitter about that. And finally, of all of this style switching that went on w- with Johnson, where did he end up? His his latest work before he died, wh- where did he finally settle? Well, I think one of the most important things about Johnson was that he was a power broker. He defined where architecture was going. Um, and he did that in, in many ways, you know, through his curation, but also by choosing the sort of kids these young stars who he would champion and very much creating this idea of star architecture of the celebrity jet setting architect making grand buildings around the world. Um, and I think he realizes that sort of uh, postmodernism is a dead end and he sees these young architects who he's supporting in their work, uh, individuals like um, Rem Koolhaas and Zaha Hadid, uh, Richard Meyer, Peter Eisenman, and above all, Frank Gehry. Um, and he, his last great uh, or significant exhibition at MoMA uh, is a show called Deconstructivist Architecture. Uh, it's a show that features many of these young kids. The show itself didn't really cohere, but it promoted many of these, his, his sort of young group of stars and the one he was attached to more than any was Gary. Uh, and he starts to sort of, his work uh, in his last phase, he starts to move away from the postmodernism and adopt a sort of um, uh, Gary's sort of, uh, uh, you know, curvaceous, uh, form-driven design and try to, to develop his own uh, a version of that. It's very much a, um, a derivative work, also looking at the sort of work of Frank Stella, uh, the artist, and sort of a, a, a collaboration of those works. And his last work uh, very much um, in that style. Mark Lamster, his book is The Man in the Glass House, Philip Johnson, Architect of the Modern Century. It's just out from Little Brown. Mark, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.